Hello, everybody. Welcome to Live at Five Home Edition right here on Broadway.com. It is Thursday, September 24th. I'm Beth Stevens. And I'm Caitlin Moynihan. Ladies and Day. Just us two here today. <laughs> so how are you doing, Caitlin? Everything good? I am excellent because of today's guest, Beth. That's right. Tell us who's here. We have three-time casual, three-time Grammy nominee, Ryan Shaw here with us today to talk all about his upcoming album. And he's been busy. He's been doing he's a lot. So, it's so good. What, so, what I've heard, it's called Imagining Marvin. We're going to talk a little more about it. So good. But first, a little bit of news. Beth, this was yeah. some exciting news today. I'm news. not like I'm not we haven't really gotten uh, like tour news recently because of everything that's going on. But today we found out that Cambodian rock band that's going to go on a national tour uh, post pandemic was the phrase a post pandemic uh, <laughs> national tour. So, of course, this is Lauren Yee's uh, Cambodian rock band. I'm going to throw up a beautiful photo. Oh, no, it's a musical. The musical off Broadway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was extended twice off Broadway. Big hit, uh, yeah. Huge hit. Uh, I think it was also, it didn't necessarily get a, a Pulitzer nomination, but I think it was in the contention zone from what I read. So the contention a, zone. A contention <laughs> zone. Um, so this is the North American tour will be presented by Broadway and Beyond Theatricals for the 2021-2022 season. It's a lot of twos. Yeah. Uh, it will definitely be playing at Berkeley Rep um, with other stops to be announced. We don't really know anything yet. Uh, obviously, it features the music of the L.A. band Dengue Fever and a direction by Shay Yu. And yeah, we don't know dates. We don't know cast, but it's happening. But it's going to the West Coast, and that's exciting. Berkeley yes, it Rep. is. All right. Melissa Errico, who you've seen it right here on Live at Five showing you all kinds of things in her house. Uh, she is going to debut a live stream concert. Now, she, of course, is a Tony nominee. It's a three-part live stream concert series called Il Parle, El Chant. Now, that means he, he speaks, she sings, because I took French in high school. Um, there we go. And it features, and of course, she was in Amour. This is why she's qualified to do this. Forget there that it she is. went to Yale. That's that's separate. <laughs> she was in the musical Amour on Broadway, and this features Francophile's song about love, desire, and mystery. So I'm hooked in there. And she will be joined Ooh. by the New Yorker's Adam Gopnik. I was just looking behind me because I have this book, Paris oh. to the Moon. He lived in Paris and often wrote about it. So it's lots of Frenchy goodness. And it's presented by the Alliance Francaise, the French Institute Alliance Francaise, or FIAF. And Ooh. that uh, will start. Uh, part one is. Can you hear me? Am I here? Uh, yep, yep. Uh, I kind of like lost you for a second. But part one is Love That Begins October 14th at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. And you can find out all the information on Broadway.com. But, you know, love, desire, mystery. Melissa Errico, what's not to love? What's not to love? I love it. <laughs> and what else? You know what else we love? We love the Broadway cast of Allegiance. That's who we oh love. Oh, my God. Of course we do. What an excellent show, which, of course, there it is. There we go. Leia Salonga, we George Takei. Uh, so the, they're going to reunite for to benefit the Actors Fund. Actually, this is brought together by uh, E2E Trex, which is a uh, they are a company that is called Hiking to Divide to Unite. So basically, it's a group bringing wow. access and awareness of climate and culture through documentaries, podcasts, and showcases of artists and Native communities. That really ties along with uh, Allegiance because obviously this was George Takai's story of his life, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Kind his of. Ex it, his experiences, He family. also experienced the Japanese internment uh, camps, but he, yeah, it wasn't exactly biographical, like, but um, that's great. So they're not gonna hide. Mm -hmm. Tell it, tell it. Okay, go on. Tell you, yeah, they're, they're not gonna hike. I mean, who knows? It doesn't say they're hiking. <laughs> I mean, but, I would hike with this gang. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're all coming together on Monday, September 28th. So next Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern time on the Actors Fund uh, YouTube channel. They're gonna have a little conversation. It's a special streaming event called How History, Location, and Adversity Inform, Inspire, and Influence Theater. So we're talking a lot. It's gonna be great. It's no hosting. hiking boots required, but you can if you want. You can wear them if you want. Um, it's hosted by Mark Montague and Gary Adamson of E2E Treks and will feature an allegiance reunion, including, of course, Telly Leung, George Takai, Ali Wang, music and lyrics co-author Jay Kuo, and co-author and producer Lorenzo Theon and producer Joey Monda. They're all going to be there. It's going to be like a little good. allegiance party next happening next Monday. That's awesome. And anything for the Actors Fund, right? Of course, Such a good organization. of course. Well, I can't wait to get to our guest because his voice is just smooth. But first, we have Today in Broadway. Beth, I, I learned a lot today. Okay. I want to learn because your topic is something I don't know a whole lot about. Which so that's school me. Yes. yes. Okay. So on this day in 1976, the long running revival of Oh Calcutta exclamation point opened at the Edison Theater. Now here's it's notorious. Photo. There you go. It's notorious. Here's a photo. And Beth, this show is notorious because they're naked. The entire Lots of show. Skin. Lots of skin. Lots yeah. of skin. So this was a huge like avant-garde theatrical review created by British drama critic Kenneth Tynan. Now, Beth, he originally wanted uh, none other than Harold Pinter to direct this, but uh, he said no. Because <laughs> Harold Pinter him. was famous for saying no to things. So there you he go. said no. Uh, <laughs> okay. Kenneth wanted a, to have a little bit of... Uh, I think that's Sir I, Kenneth to you. Yes. Oh. Sir Kenneth. Yeah, he hoped that having uh, Harold a part of it would kind of make it seem more legit, but uh, that didn't end up happening and ended up being directed by Jacques Levy, who directed both the original and the revival. Do you know who helped write the sketches for this show, Beth? I know that there were some famous people, but really it's about the nudity, but go on. I want to hear Yes. More. So th th it's a review. It's just a bunch of sketches and each thing, like, it's not a full, like, it's a review. Musical as we know it. Yes, it's a review. Right. So these sketches were written by stars like Samuel Beckett, John Lennon, that John Lennon, Sam Shepard, uh, Edna O'Brien, Jules Pfeiffer, and the producer Tenen. They all wrote it. And it features the cast just being naked pretty much the entire time. <laughs> Caused a whole lot of controversy. You cropped that, didn't you? I... You I cropped the heck photo. out of it. You're, yeah. wel mm -hmm. you're welcome to the but audience. It was a long running hit. It ran for a long. Long. Right? It opened um, on this day, 1976, and ran until August 6, 1989. And this revival is five years after the original opened, opened originally off Broadway at the Eden Theater and then transferred to the Belasco in 1971, and then closed in August 1972 after a thousand performances. Still pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. But five years later, the revival showed up and it was a huge hit. Uh, its revival um, is the longest running review in Broadway wow. history. And it's the second longest running revival in history right behind Chicago. Chicago. And in total, it's the eighth longest running Broadway show uh, ever. Still? Still today. Wow. Okay, so, well, yeah. you know, all, all those other long running shows can, can keep on rolling along. Uh, we learned a lot. Along. There was a lot of thank you for your service because that was a lot to take in. Um, it was a lot to take in. Tell, <laughs> do you want to tell us about our guest today? Yes. Guys, as I said earlier today, we have three time Grammy nominee Ryan Shaw here with us today to talk all about his brand new upcoming album called Imagining Marvin, which is inspired by the incredible Marvin Gaye, who, guys, Ryan understudied him, understudied Marvin, the role of Marvin in Motown on Broadway. So a lot, a lot happening here. It's all amazing. The first single just dropped. Amazing. You guys can follow him on social media at this is Ryan. I want to make sure I get it right. This is Ryan. This is Ryan on social media. You guys can put all of your questions in the comments down below. And please welcome Ryan and Beth. 
Hi, Ryan. Hi, Aya. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you because your new project is super exciting. It's called Imagining Marvin, as I'm sure everyone's already heard. But first, I want to talk about your Broadway pedigree. <laughs> you like, well, he, we know he's a gorgeous singer, and and so you actually have it on your chest. So tell us about your Broadway pedigree for a sec. Well, it's it's weird because I actually moved to New York in 19. 98 to do Broadway. And I was actually on tour with Tyler Perry at the time. And I ended up staying and had my first audition the day that they left for Rent. And uh, Broadway never happened then. But 17 years later, in a turn, in a turn of events, I was uh, cast in Motown the Musical as Stevie Wonder. And you got and, merch. Uh, say again? And you got merch. Yes. And I have merch. Well, these were, I think this was our performance T-shirt. So whenever we did promo, this was our oh, one of the blue and gold promo T-shirt. So it was that. So um, you played Stevie Wonder. Yes, and I also understudied Marvin Gaye, hmm. which was awesome because it was weird because Stevie Wonder in real life was the only artist who never left Motown. I think he's still in Motown to this day, wow. but he wasn't a, he wasn't a principal in Motown the Musical, which I was like, wah, 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 but you know. <laughs> Also, just wanted the principal paycheck as well, so we'll we'll just be honest here. Um, oh, yeah, but, you know, but it was a great experience, a great feature, and uh, but I got to understudy Marvin, who was a, a principal, and it was it was awesome. And of course, Barry Gordy was really very very involved with Motown the musical, so obviously you got to meet and work with him. Tell me a little bit about that. Ah, BG, he was there daily, daily. Yeah. He's he was sort of an open book. He it was really like amazing to see him just literally be amongst the cast and. At a certain point uh, throughout the rehearsal and the production process, we all had a chance to sit with him for like 10, 15 minutes and we could ask him whatever we wanted. And I'll just leave it at that. But he was there. He was great. He was a, an open <laughs> book. Uh, his main thing was we, we want to show the love that Motown, the positive love that Motown uh, brought to the world and how it weaved into the fabric. So you know, a lot of the drama or the rumors of drama that we've heard about throughout the years is not necessarily part of the musical, but um, some alluded to, but it was more about that Motown love and that's what it was. Yeah, about. it was a total celebration of the Motown sound. Absolutely. And Absolutely. this new um, album that you're putting out, Imagining Marvin, which by the way, comes out November 27th, but you already have a single out. Yes. Like, you guys, so good. Um, it. It was, tell me a little bit about what the inspiration was because Marvin Gaye would have turned 80 last year, mm -hmm. right? So is that where it came from, his birthday? In part, it's like when, you know, it was, I had taken a detour from my recording career and when Motown started in 2013 and I've just been sort of like, oh, this is my dream. I, that's why I moved to New York to do Broadway and now I'm here. And uh, so I took a detour from recording and then, you know, have new management now. And we're like, well, what do you really want to do? I'm like, I want to get back to my music. And uh, and then realizing that not only did I understudy Marvin in Motown the Musical, and not only was his 80th birthday, but my third Grammy nomination was for a Beatles cover of Yesterday, but it was inspired by Marvin Gaye's version of the mm. Beatles Yesterday, which a lot of people don't know. And so just having him all tied in, just it just felt right to honor him. And um, yeah, and then like, it, well, COVID changed everything, so it would have been a nice celebration in his birthday year. But you know, the year eighty one, we'll we'll just go with eighty one. But uh, <laughs> everything's but, yeah. delayed now. Yeah, exactly. But but with what's happening, and also Marvin, you know, being that iconic artist, and what I and what inspired me most about Marvin was his his fight to do what he felt was right for him as an artist. Because if, if you saw Motown, you saw like the conversations that him and Barry Gordy would have about the What's Going On album. And Barry Gordy didn't want him to release it. He was like, it's too political. You're a sex mm -hmm. symbol. You're in Motown. You're a pop star. And he was like, I don't care. My brother just died in Vietnam. I have to do this. And so the resolve was, BG was like, okay, I'll let you do this because you are Marvin Gaye. And if you're wrong, you'll learn something. And if I'm wrong, I'll learn something. And BG learned something um, months later when it became like, you know, the, one of the biggest, you know, <laughs> Motown selling records. So it was really, it's really cool. And there's a little bridge between Marvin Gaye and you besides your work with Motown and of course your recording career, which is Valerie Simpson. So tell yeah. me about working with her. Uh, ha, ha. Valerie is like the best person in the world. She has like a heart of gold and she's like re oozing talent from like every pore. Mm -hmm. And so when I first moved to New York, I went to the sugar bar. That's the first place they tell you to go, go to the sugar bar and it still right. happens. Well, 
It's still it's still around, right? It will still be happening. Yes, it's on 72nd between right. Broadway and West End. Mm-hmm. Thursday mm-hmm. nights. And now Tuesday nights is nothing but the blues. Thursday nights is the full on like open mic, one of the biggest open mics in the city that's still around. And um, yeah. And so you go and I went and I sang, you know, a little intimidated because Valerie usually hangs out there. So she'll be in the room. And then so when I finished singing the first time, she came up to me and she was like, what are you doing with that voice? And I was like, <laughs> I'm just trying to make it. You know, and she was like, you should come back. You should sing again. You should do a show here because they also do. You can do your own shows. And so I started doing my music there. And she and Nick, when Nick was still alive, just took me mm-hmm. under their wings and they became like my industry parents. So when it was time to do the Imagine and Marvin, I was like, oh, well, that's a great Marvin connection because she and Nick wrote like pretty much 99 percent of Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell's hits. Like ain't nothing like right. the real thing. Yeah. Uh, you're all need to get by. Ain't no mountain high enough. I was like, oh. And so I called. her. I was like, I'm doing this project. I had done a demo of of one of the songs. And I was like, I want to play something for you to make sure it fits me because I didn't want it to feel like, oh, he's doing a Marvin Gaye song. I wanted the reaction to be, oh, wow, this is great. Oh, it's Marvin. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to honor Marvin, but not impersonate Marvin. The same right. as like Stevie on, on Broadway. I didn't want to be Stevie. I want to just, you take their essence and you merge it with your own artistry, you know, and then it becomes its own thing, but you feel you feel as much me as you feel Stevie or you feel Marvin. And so that was that was the goal. So after I played it for her, she was like, yeah, that's something there. And I said, OK, cool. And then I called her a couple of days or a week later and I was like, would you want to would you write an original song with me for this record? And she was like, sure. And then a couple of days later, I get a voice memo from her. And then she calls me. She's like, now, I usually don't just send people my voice memos. I usually take it in the studio and I doctor it up a mm-hmm. little bit. But she'd be like, but I, but I know you'll get it. You'll get it. And it was just her on the piano with that beautiful melody and most of the lyric for the chorus, you know. Strong men can, can break down. Oh, don't okay. be melting me. Down. No, no. And I was like this, smiling ear to ear. And then she was like, well, if you love it, let's get together. Let's finish it. Let's write some verses. Let's do this bridge. And what happened yeah <laughs> i mean first of all you're amazing and anytime you want to sing to me you just go right ahead but <laughs> that song is like an anthem for male i i'm gonna say like male vulnerability about you know really being yourself like honesty but it, it feels like an anthem because as we just heard from those soaring notes it just <laughs> it just goes out there in just such a, a big way tell me a little yeah. bit about the themes of it yeah when when I heard it, it was very timely. You know, in the last 10 years, you know, the world has kind of gone to to there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's just a lot more issues now. And I, I feel like <clears throat> we, you know, I grew up, you know, I'm an 80s kid. So we grew up in a time where it's like you're not allowed to be a certain way or feel a certain thing, you know, especially as men. You be strong and don't let them see you cry. What you crying for? Harden up, toughen up, be a man. Yeah. It's like, but I'm also, first, I'm a human. And human to live my full human experience, I need to explore my also my emotions. And we've been told to shut that off. And back then, I feel like it was it was fine because you know the world was different. You know, if I was on the yeah. playground or on the basketball court and I fell and hurt myself, you know, it'd be me and six of my friends, and they'd be like, "Oh man, you're okay." And then if I'm okay, then we'd all laugh. But now, whether or not you're okay, there are you went viral. Now there are seven million people that have seen you fall and you can't walk down the street without someone pointing or talking. That's a lot more pressure. And when people don't get to express how they feel about things, when it's suddenly one moment becomes all over the world, then you get people going into a mall and shooting up a mall or walking into a school and doing all these crazy things that mm. wouldn't matter. And this song just speaks to living your full human experience as a man. You know, if, if something is bothering you, if there was death in the family, or if you're just sad, cry, be sad, let these emotions out. And it was very crazy because we wrote the song on, I want to say it was the 9th of April of 2019. And Mm -hmm. then the next day I was going through Instagram and Puff Daddy had just posted a thing that he had just had a three hour cry. And he was like, you got to let it out. If if you go to this April 9th, I think it's April 9th. You go to this April 9th, he posted and I sent it to Valerie immediately. I was like, we're we're right. We're on the money. This is it's happening now. And she was like, it was in it was already in the atmosphere when we wrote it. And the next day he posted that. And it was just like a, a confirmation that this is needed. It's time, you know, live your full human experience and be that person that you what be be genuine to the person that you are, you know. 
All right, we're gonna take questions from fans because you have legions of them. But first I have one more question, which is mm -hmm. what other theater show would you like to do? I know you did Jesus Christ Superstar. I would like Could to you... do that again, actually. And you played Judas, right? I played Judas. It was really crazy because that was a, I don't know if we have how much time we have, but it was a really sort of cool like experience because at, at one point in the audition process, I actually auditioned for Jesus and Judas. Mm -hmm. I auditioned for Judas. And then it was a long time I didn't hear anything and they called me back in for Jesus because they were like, we're having a problem finding a Jesus to your Judas. And and then at one point they talked about, oh, maybe we could flip a coin between Jesus and Judas and do a production where before the show starts that night, we flip we a alternate. coin. And alternate. Wow. So I would love to explore that. And the directors of that show were re really great. It was the it was the import from London. Um, other than that, I, I don't, I'm not old enough yet or maybe I don't care the weight yet, but I would love to play Sweeney Todd. You know, every great singer says that. It's, it's my it's favorite a, musical. It's a great score. Ever. It's the best. But I'm now I'm all like, about hearing you sing world, like great, They have to change the keys for me, and I'm not sure if they would, because I'll be more like, there's a hole in the world like a great black pit. But he's like, there's a hole in the world. And it's very anticlimactic to hear me sing down that low. It's not a good thing. But you can do <laughs> yeah. anything. All right, Caitlin, I'm bringing you back. Are you there? To give us some fan questions. Yes. Woohoo! Okay, I love that little video thing. Okay, first question first is Tim on Facebook wants to know what the heck are the Grammys like and what hmm. what was it like getting your first nomination and now having three? Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah, the, the Grammys, my first time to the Grammys was crazy. I was on Columbia and it was like, you kind of realize how people sort of get lost and lose their mind. Thank God I had friends around me that kept me grounded. Like, why are you acting like that? What are you doing? This is not, it's not your reality, but you literally, you would go and like the week, I went the whole week. And so you do performances like the Black Eyed Peas, uh, the green carpet event I did. And you know, you're singing at all these things. And every time you go to these like suites, the gifting suites and people are like, oh, just go in and take a suit. I'm like, that's Paul Smith. That's like a $3,000 suit. Yeah. Are you going to wear it on red carpet? Oh, take this. Oh, here's a $6,000 go watch. Oh, here's this. And I'm just like, I made it. I won. You know, you know. So I was like, I don't even care if I won a grand. I came home with like ten thousand dollars worth of like swag. Swag. You know? like, Come on. So, and the, but then the next year I was nominated. The next year, no, the next year I went back and I wasn't nominated. And then you go to the mm -hmm. same gifting suite. They're like, I'm sorry, you're not on our list. Well, who are you again? I'm like, girl, you just saw me last year. We we made the joke about the champagne. What are you? Now, oh, you don't remember me now? I talked about your earrings. You don't. Okay. <laughs> I'll be back next year when I'm nominated again. I'll see you in a year and a half. And so it was, <laughs> it was awesome. The Grammys are awesome. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> that kind of goes into the next one. Okay. Jane wants to know now that you obviously have really good success with in the music world and you've done Broadway and theater, which one was your original like goal? Did you have your aim to be one or the other? Or did you always kind of want to do both? I mean, I've been an artist, I mean, just from growing up singing and mostly it was gospel in Atlanta, but the reason I moved to New York was to be a, bro a Broadway actor. And mm -hmm. so, you know, having that experience, like I say, 17 years in the making was awesome. Um, but my- Was there a show that sparked that, that made you want to move to New York and, and try for Broadway? Um, it's really weird. I went to a performing arts high school for one year, my mother pulled me out because I grew up Pentecostal. She said it was too worldly and she did not want me to take ballet and wear ballet slippers and all that stuff. And she was opposed to it. So I went for one year, but at orientation, oddly enough, they the senior, the senior class did a scene or a couple of scenes from the senior musical and it was the boyfriend. Mm. Ooh. My first year there was the boyfriend and, and then we did a trilogy of uh, music theater. And the first musical that I ever saw was the recording of the original Sweeney Todd. And that's why Simp became my first one. And I wanted to do Sweeney Todd and I wanted to do The Boyfriend. And when I got here, my first audition was for Rent. Hmm. And I had 14 callbacks. Oh, man. Man, it, I remember wow. it was Heidi over at Telsey and she was like, after the 14th time, she was like, oh, you want to see you for Benny? I was like, you have seen me 13 times for Benny. This is the last time I'm coming in for Benny. <laughs> Nothing has changed. I've I've exhausted all possible. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, but it was that was awesome. Oh man. My first love is stage recording career, letting mm -hmm. was out. Yeah. I'm also writing a musical with my sister too. So hopefully in a maybe half a decade or so, they'll be you'll be hearing about that. We'll meet you back here. 
Original music, yeah. <laughs> original book, original music is really good too. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love that. Ooh, okay. So Johnny on face, sorry, on YouTube, not Facebook. Johnny there oh. wants to know what is. Oh no, I lost. It. Oh no, 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 no. Sorry, Johnny. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, Johnny. I'm so yeah. sorry. I just saw it and it went away. Oh, oh, okay. Found it. He wants to know if you have one memory that stands out from your time with Motown. Hmm. Oh, me. Oh, absolutely. Um, it was the family and friends day because there were so many celebrities coming to open at night. They had a soft opening to a couple of days before. Mm -hmm. And um, and everybody was like, you know, all the big stars are coming on opening night, which was you know, the next week or next Tuesday, it was like a Wednesday, the week before, whatever. And so I'm um, getting changed in the dressing room after family and friends night. And like all these people that we hear about, like the secretary from Motown was there and I'm getting dressed and they're like, Ryan, I'm like, what? I'm getting changed. They're like, come downstairs. I'm like, what? And they're like, it's Stevie. I got dressed in an instant. I flew downstairs. I walk into Valicia's dressing room, who was our uh, amazing Diana Ross. Hey, Valicia, Ross. Hey, everyone knows her royalty. Uh, I love her, my sister. Hey, Valicia, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> and uh, I walk into her dressing room and it's Barry Gordy sitting on the couch with Stevie Wonder. And I just look and then Barry goes, hey, Stevie, this is our uh, Stevie Ryan Shaw. And I go, hey, Mr. Wonder, it's uh, awesome to meet you. Uh, scary honor, but honor to meet you. He's like, oh, you got nothing to be scared about. I was rooting for you the whole time. You sounded amazing. Now, and if you hear the recording, the cast recording in Science Hill Delivered, there's a riff that I do between the verses that Stevie never did. And mm -hmm. so it's like, done a lot of foolish things that I really didn't mean. And I want to tell you, baby. Stevie sings that riff back to me and says, I like that. He remembered the riff, <laughs> note for note, after hearing it one time. He sang it back, hey, I like that. And I was like, Please tell me somebody's recording this because this is it's ridiculous. That's my best moment from, from Motown. He gave me his blessing to be him. And then after that, all nervousness was over because if you're playing someone and they tell you, you you are me, you're okay. And to he be remembered me. the riff. And he remembered what? the riff. That's what I wish someone had a recording of. Man. That's an endorsement like I've never heard before. Exactly. That's an endorsement. That is signed, sealed, and delivered. That was oh signed. My God. That, yes. Yeah. Oh, that is like the best party story ever. I would literally tell everybody I ever knew would know that story. That. <laughs> And, and then I completely fanned out. I like completely fanned out because then oh, yeah. I had a picture of Stevie on my phone. And so I would just walk up to random people like, oh, I'm sorry, did you need to make a phone call? Did you need to make a phone? Did you need to make a phone? Oh, you didn't? Okay, I'm sorry. That's, that's just me and Stevie. That's fine. It's, it's, it's cool. It's cool. Is it still there? Yeah, party. Yeah, party for Motown, but you know, you don't you don't need to worry about that. I just thought you needed, oh, I thought we could call. That's all. You know. <laughs> oh man. Amazing. That Amazing. is the best story ever. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. And Aaron wants to know if there was if there's any other music icon slash legend that you would like to portray. Oh, Sam Cooke. Oh, Sam Cooke and or Donny Hathaway, my two favorite singers, my two favorite male singers. Yeah, nice. And there are nice. so many characteristics of both of them in my voice. Mm -hmm. as well as me and Marvin and I'm just like a hodgepodge of vocals from the past yeah <laughs> with a, with me in the present but it's and only the legends only the yeah. legends only the legends yes. <laughs> yes I love it I'm here for it sign me up <laughs> well Ryan thank you so much for joining us everyone go get imagining Marvin November 27th you can listen to the first single right now wherever you get your singles on Spotify etc right and uh, Caitlin, will you please take us on out? Uh, gladly. Thank you guys so much for tuning in for another great and fun episode of Live at Five Home Edition. You can follow along where we get your podcast by searching for hashtag Live at Five and hitting that subscribe button. Be sure to tune in tomorrow when we talk to Constantine Maroulis. Tony nominee Constantine Maroulis will be here tomorrow. And taking us out today is a clip of Mr. Ben Platt singing a little bit of Sweeney Todd Sondheim. We did not plan this from today's guest. He's playing, singing a little bit of Sweeney Todd in honor of Ben Platt's birthday. Happy birthday, Ben. <laughs> what is that? It's priest. Have a little priest. Is it really good? Sir, it's too good. At least. Then again, they don't commit sins of the flesh. So it's pretty fresh. Off a 
whole lot of fat, only where it's sat. Haven't you got poet or something like that? No, you see, the trouble with poet is how do you know it's deceased? Try the priest. Go on, go on. 